All right. Welcome, 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 everybody. Really excited um, to get into today's topic with this incredible panel. So we're talking today about how game titles impact your esports program. Um, and we have got an amazing crew with us today. So we're going to go around the horn here and do quick introductions. Uh, tell the folks uh, your your name, your role, maybe a little bit about your background and your favorite game to play currently. Um, I'm going to kick this over first to Caitlin. Hi, everybody. My name is Caitlin Finantha. I am the director of esports at St. Mary's University here in San Antonio, Texas. Um, my favorite game to play at the moment is probably League of Legends or Animal Crossing. Um, and my background in esports um, prior to joining um, the, the wonderful folks here at St. Mary's University, um, I was doing a lot of uh, marketing in esports um, for a couple of years before finally uh, settling in San Antonio, Texas. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, uh, Josh Harrison. I am director of marketing over at Bond Studios. Uh, we are the developers and recent publishers of Knockout City, um, which is, uh, you know, I know some of the other people here have, have brought that into their esports programs. Uh, been in games for a little over 10 years now. And um, I mean, uh, favorite game to play. I'm excited to play Stray that just came out today, I guess. I did. I did hear about that one. That's the game about the cat, right? You're, you are a cat? Yeah. Yeah. Cyberpunk cat. <laughs> Love it. Um, Chris Turner. Hi, Christopher Turner, um, Southern University Law Center, uh, which we have a mixed reality virtual innovation gaming and esports institute uh, where we help underrepresented communities get into the space, whether it be law, uh, being a creative, uh, whatever that's in the ecosystem. Um, also, uh, on the same landmass, we have Southern University and Southern University Laboratory School which I'm the esports director for both programs. Favorite games at the moment because I've been traveling and all I've had is my PC would probably be Fortnite and not just because Josh is on the call, Knockout City. <laughs> I love So you're not pandering is what you're saying. No, I'm not. Genuine. No, I'm love not. it. Genuine. <laughs> day, day Avilas, one. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Chris Avilas. I am a high school teacher here in New Jersey. Uh, during the pandemic as a way to get uh, kids to stay connected. I started a nonprofit esports league for the schools here in New Jersey. Uh, and uh, I like to say, I guess it's escalated quickly. We have almost 40% of the schools in New Jersey playing in our league. Um, and so that's pretty much uh, kind of the day to day. If I'm not teaching, I'm helping run uh, Garden State Esports with my team, which is all educators. Uh, and they like to make fun of me because basically I started an esports league uh, to help kids play video games. And now I have no time to play video games myself. Uh, but when I do, I like to play Hearthstone. I got two boys under three. Um, so I can kind of play Hearthstone in one hand and I can feed them with the other hand and all that good stuff. So I try, I try to play when I can, but I'm a big Hearthstone fan for the last couple of years. Love it. Two under three. That is serious. We were there once. We are not there anymore. There is light at the end of that tunnel, Chris. Um, so, so first and foremost here, um, we're going to hop in and just kind of um, lay a little groundwork and, and talk about, you know, what is esports and why are we here, right? So if folks are tuning in for the first time uh, and they're saying, okay, what is esports? What are we talking about today? Um, you know, I think it's important that we, we dive into that. So um, I know people define esports in different ways. Uh, I know traditionally what we like to say is, you know, competitive video gaming between human opponents, right? So that could be 1v1, it could be 6v6, um, but it's important that there's a human on both ends of that. Um, and it's important that it's competitive. Um, anybody else have anything that they usually add or, you know, where their definition might might change from there? I guess I'll go with it. Like, you know, within my community, uh, esports is is not it's not new, but it's it's hard for African Americans and people of color to kind of grasp because it's not traditional sports. So I like to tell them, hey, you know, it's a it's it's the chocolate over the broccoli approach, or you know, it's a gateway to everything STEM and try to connect the career and college pathways, 
uh, to what esports and gaming can bring. Um, and that starts a whole different type of conversation as a, the panelists and the, you, you know this. And so I like to lead with that as well as, you know, it's competitive video game. Yeah, absolutely. So um, anybody else want to hop in or we want to dive to the questions? What we're all here for. Awesome. So let's start at the beginning. When we say how game titles impact your esports program, um, so some folks might have an idea of what they're thinking of there, right? So they might be thinking, well, we're ta obviously talking about console versus PC today or the inclusion of one specific title. Um, so, so what do you feel like we mean when we say how game titles impact your esports program and why is that important to you? Uh, we'll start with Caitlin. Yeah, this is a, this is a pretty big question. I'm glad that this is the, the topic for today. Um, when me and my um, assistant coaches uh, started this program and we had our first discussion of, you know, what are the games that we're going to incorporate? There are a lot of, there are a lot of variables that went into that decision. Um, the first one was, you know, what are, what are students interested in? What are they playing? And um, is that video game title also an esports title? So that was the first thing that we considered. Um, and then it was this kind of laundry list of things that we needed to check some boxes on, like the, the game rating. Um, how accessible is that game? You know, do you have to have high speed internet and a high end PC, or do you need high speed internet and a console? More often than not, the high speed internet was key. So that also affected a lot of the, 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 the choices that we made regarding game titles. Um, opportunity, monetary, um, some games are free to play while other games you have to purchase every single year. Call of Duty is one of those games. Um, some of the other things that we considered were, um, the online culture surrounding certain games. You know, did we have to have some difficult conversations when we brought in certain games? Um, for example, when we brought in two M-rated games, Call of Duty and Rainbow Six Siege, uh, bringing that to a Catholic school was a very big conversation. But going back to the first thing we asked ourselves, what are students playing? That's what's coming up a lot more often than other games. Um, so bringing that to St. Mary's made sense on paper. Um, and then again, with any game title, what is the flexibility and longevity? Um, these games may not be around forever. So how do we prepare ourselves to pivot? you know, to add more games, to sunset certain teams, um, and to keep our students engaged year to year, um, because maybe their freshman year they want to play Hearthstone, but by their senior year, we no longer have enough people to field a, for, uh, a full Hearthstone team. Love it. Um, Chris Aviles, what do you think? So I have spent a countless amount of hours thinking about this since start, uh, starting Garden State Esports. Um, cause like Caitlin said, you know, not only do we have to worry about the accessibility because equity, uh, and inclusivity is always top of mind. We also have to consider what the colleges are doing. We have to consider the ratings of the games. We have to consider what we're seeing in K-12 as far as budgets and what schools have access to. So looking at our, uh, the way that we lay out our schedule, we have to make sure that every school can play with us with just a switch. Um, because a lot of schools don't have these PCs because in K-12, there's been a push to Chromebooks and decentralizing the computer lab. Um, you know, whether or not these games are free to play, we have to think about the communities that we want to serve. We know that communities of color uh, tend to play a lot more fighting games, a lot more sports games. We know that a game like Super Smash brings out all kinds of different kids. Um, so I have spent a shocking amount of time thinking about this because I have... Uh, like I said, close to 40% of the state in the league, uh, you know, 51% of the kids in Garden State Esports are kids of color. Uh, about 46% of the schools in our league are Title I schools. Um, we have schools, you know, all over the state. We have high schools, we have middle schools. My youngest team goes down to fourth grade. Um, so not only do we have to put a lot of thought into what these games are and, you know, the opportunities surrounding them, um, I would imagine, unlike college, we even have to deal with what we're allowed to play. You know, we recently got League of Legends back, um, you know, but there's still some games that we do not have access to. 
uh, which is an absolute shame. And then on top of that, we also have to think about, right, going back to what Chris said earlier, if our goal through esports is to serve these kids and really just create opportunities, um, we also got to start to think outside the box. You know, one of the things that I've added to our league, and we're going to launch in September, is the Cybersecurity Esports League. Because it's the most number one, it's the number one most in demand job right now in New Jersey, like it is in most of the country. So if I can bring that into Garden State Esports and give these kids the opportunity to, you know, uh, get into cybersecurity, I, I think that's a win for everybody. But we're also doing stuff with Minecraft. Uh, you know, we're doing some stuff. Um, even we're, you know, about 11% of our league are students um, who have IEPs, 504s, or an autism spectrum diagnosis. And one of the biggest pieces of feedback we got from that population is they really want to compete, um, but sometimes it's overwhelming, right? That even though, you know, they're not necessarily sitting across from who they're competing against, um, it's just too much to be in that moment, that 1v1 or 6v6 scenario. So we've even added uh, Mario Kart time trials where they have all week to turn in their best time. Um, we've added speed runs to see who can kill the Ender Dragon the fastest. Um, you know, not do not only do we do um, Minecraft like Bed Wars style esports, but now we're doing build challenges. So we're trying to provide as much competition for these kids, even if it goes beyond the games, um, like cybersecurity, or we even do contests around um, cosplay. Um, we do fandom art contests, but then also just the way that we think about competition and adding some of these asynchronous kind of indirect competitions. So. Um, I have spent a stunning amount of time uh, just figuring out what does competition look like to serve a diverse state like Jersey. Chris Turner, hop in. Yeah, I think I, I think uh, you know, Kate and Chris did a good job. It's just um, you know, I probably I'm probably one of the only ones in the country that has a full scope and work I work day to day in it. So like Chris handed that, like, you know, we ran into um, an obstacle this year at Southern University Laboratory School where we were part of a Minecraft program, but we're a Google school. And so now you have to go try to get those Microsoft keys. We're tied on one, so we can't, you know, we don't have a budget to go buy those. So, you know, you, you have all those aspects, like you have tools that can, you can integrate gaming into the classroom quite easy. Um, you know, our middle school kids and, and high school kids, you know, we're almost 100% African-American. So, you know, traditionally sports titles are our go-to, uh, fighting games are our go-to. But when you have high school leads that don't offer those titles for a competition, now you're in a pickle. Um, uh, same thing with, with middle school. Um, and sh shout out to knockout city again because i think it's a it's a great cross play game it's free and that's that's a different conversation too you know what's accessible uh to to go back to what chris said before and then if you look at those take those kids and you look at the college track and say hey well college they're playing valorant <laughs> they're playing call of duty they're playing all these titles that we don't have accessibility to because of the lack of pcs and the lack of you know good wi-fi good internet um, you know, I said Wi-Fi, but we all know hard, hard, hard wire is the way to go. It's, it's, it puts you in a mind state. Um, and a lot of us that are for, for the kids and student first, we stress about those things countless of hours, uh, kind of like Chris said, and it's always a, a thought process. So we have to gravitate to <clears throat> pretty much the, the, the college and career pathways to kind of settle that. And so how do I get a kid involved? You know, maybe we, we make a club instead of a, a, just an esports team so they can be involved, they can learn, they can feel like they're a part of a, a ecosystem and kind of show them skill sets along the way to, to show them, you know, hey, you don't have to be that top gamer. You can you come over here and, and do, you know, countless uh, uh, array of jobs. You know, you just search it on your search engine today. It's so many jobs in gaming and esports at the moment. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. Josh, I would hate to follow those three, but you're going to have to. So, so talk to us a little bit about what does the, you know, game titles and that impact on the programs mean to, to you all? 
Yeah, I mean, so we're obviously coming from a slightly different perspective because we're the developer, we're the ones that are actually making these games. And we tried to take that perspective when designing this game of, you know, accessibility was mentioned by, um, you know, by the rest of the group multiple times. And we wanted something that, yeah, you could play it on, you know, your high spec PC, or you could play it on any console. You could play it on a Switch, you could play it on PlayStation or Xbox. Um, we, uh, the, the title launched as this mid price premium game a little over a year ago for 20 bucks. Um, but schools that did have budgetary restrictions, you know, if you reached out to us, uh, we would get you keys. We would get you as many keys as you needed because we just wanted people to play it. Um, and then as of, uh, literally last month, we're now free to play. Um, and cause we just want to get more people in, um, even when designing the, the gameplay of the game itself. We, we wanted to make sure that this wasn't something where, you know, there was this super steep skill curve where you felt like you had to play for, you know, weeks or months before you finally got good. We wanted you to be able to pick up a controller, jump into a game, have fun right away, but still give you these hints that there is this high skill ceiling where if you do want to put in the time and the teamwork, it is something that you can get like really, really competitive at and get really, really good at. And that was just a really interesting balance for us to find. Excellent. Thank you. So um, now we're going to dive into um, some of the specifics. So let's talk about just what are the results, um, you know, when we look at a at a program, right, as you're building out an, an esports program and you're looking at the different genres, right? Let's start there. The different genres that you might have. Um, Chris Avilas, maybe take us through a little bit of what are those, what's the impact of the different genres of games on your program? So we try to offer um, a MOBA sports game um, and a, uh, a fighting game or, and, or a first person shooter each one of our seasons. And we run a typical uh, scholastic athletic type of season, right? So the way that we play mirrors what um, traditional athletics does. So we have three seasons uh, and, you know, it's tough to get a game like Madden in. It's tough to get a game, um, you know, like FIFA in. So our primary sports game uh, in a lot of ways, because it is so accessible is Rocket League. And so we offer Rocket League in three different versions, you know, a 3v3 in the uh, fall, we do um, uh, Snow Day in the winter is kind of like a little more of a fun kind of game version. Uh, and then we do 2v2 in the spring. So we always try to offer those sports games, the MOBAs, um, what FPSs we can because we won't play um, uh, rated M games. So there it goes like your Call of Duties, your Rainbow Sixes, your uh, Counter-Strike and stuff like that. So we offer like a, like a Fortnite, we offer Valorant, we offer uh, Overwatch, stuff like that. Um, and then your MOBAs, uh, and then right now, our, the fighting game we're focusing most on is, um, besides Smash, is Brawlhalla, because Brawlhalla we like a lot too, because you can play on your phone. Um, but the reason that we stick to those categories and make sure that we're offering uh, multiple games in that genre during different seasons is because we want to take advantage of any opportunities at the collegiate level. Right. So looking at what's offered at that level, we know that those are the scholarship games and we have to make sure that uh, our varsity experience mirrors where these opportunities are going to be. Um, you know, and, and that actually, believe it or not, kind of came to fruition this year. Just a couple of weeks ago, um, we had our first two kids from Garden State Esports, uh, you know, get recruited to play at the next level. We have one kid who's going to play League of Legends at St. Clair uh, and we have another student who's going to play Rocket League uh, at Jersey City University. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's with that in mind is from a genre point, um, we want to make sure we're offering what's being scholarshiped at the collegiate level, right? We want to make sure we're mirroring so that way our most talented players do get those opportunities, um, you know, to play those games. And so we have a knockout city that we fit into our sports games as well. Um, we have a couple other games that we are checking out, like uh, Project P when that finally launches. Uh, probably fit into that sports genre. So we'll be able to diversify a little bit from Rocket League. But that's the big thing for us is making sure at our varsity level or, you know, we're offering what the colleges are. So you mentioned MOBA, but for folks who don't know, what is a MOBA and what, what are a couple games that might fall into that category? Yeah, I don't really know what a MOBA is. I've never played them, but I know it's uh, your League of Legends and your Dotas and stuff like that. Basically, you have to defend uh, the towers, you know, when the little people run down the lanes and stuff and 
uh, people really, really like it. So we offer it. Perfect. Caitlin, what do you think? Um, yeah. So this is, this one's really interesting for us because our program has existed for about three years now. We're going into our third year rather. Um, and the kinds of games that we have offered has absolutely changed. <laughs> um, what we started with year one is not necessarily what we have going into year three. Um, one of the genres that we find a lot of challenges with though is sports games. Um, and not because they're not accessible, but because we find at the college level there is not an adequate number of competitions available for our students to compete in. So it makes it very hard for us, very challenging for us to offer a varsity level team for a game that we feel that we feel may not have a, enough competition. Um, whereas if we look at, you know, FPS type games, um, we're kind of FPS heavy. We have a Fortnite team. We have a Rainbow Six Siege team. We have a Call of Duty team. And most recently, we added a Halo team. Um, we had it. We added Halo over Valorant because Halo is a little bit more accessible to more students than Valorant, which is PC only. Um, the other two games that Three games that exist in our program are League of Legends, which is that MOBA that um, I think Chris Chris pretty much said what <laughs> I would say. It's basically another way of destroying your opponent's base. Uh, and there's a hundred ways to do it, but as long as the opponent's base is gone at the end of the, the match, that's a victory for you. Um, so we do have a League of Legends team um, and Rocket League, which does kind of fit in that sports category. Um, and, and this may surprise some, but we've also brought a StarCraft II team. Um, and the reason being, there is a corporate esports league that has a college division that facilitates StarCraft II competition. And what we have found is that there are a lot of students on campus that want to get involved in esports, that want to be competitive, but have zero experience with any of the other games. More often than not, they are willing to learn how to play StarCraft and get their first taste of competition before they move on to a varsity team. Um, now, I don't know if that has to do with the kind of game that StarCraft II is, which is a real-time strategy, but I think it may also have something to do with the... Um, StarCraft II is a very known quantity. It's it. I think some people may joke that, you know, if you're in esports, you got to know your roots, and our roots come from StarCraft II. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the kind of game definitely matters. Um, I think Chris mentioned earlier, you know, the, the M rated titles are a little bit challenging to bring to any esports program, ours as well. I mean, we are only approved for those two M rated titles. Um, but more often than not, it is what our students are playing. Um, so it, it's a delicate balance. And I think looking towards the future, the way that it's looking, I think we're going to be adding more FPS games to our lineup. All right. So Josh, we're going to put you in the hot seat next. I'm going to add a question to yours. So in addition to, you know, how does this impact a program or, or what kind of considerations around genre? I want to know what genre you define Knockout City as, because I feel like I would struggle to put it into a bucket. I mean, that's that was a really interesting challenge that we had when we launched the game and we're like trying to figure out who who is our target audience for this, because it's like it is a little bit of sports. It's it's a little bit of, uh, you know, this like team based shooter, but not a shooter because there are no guns. Um, but uh, and that's one of the reasons that we found a lot of success in um, in scholastic spaces, I think, because we are we have a lot of the trappings of a shooter, but at the same time, there are no guns. So it's something that, you know, nobody dies in Knockout City, you just get knocked out. Um, so it, it fits right at home in a middle school environment, let alone, you know, high school or, or college or anything. Um, and I think that that wasn't specifically what we set out to do with Knockout City. Um, but 
when we kind of realize the opportunity there, again, going back to that accessibility piece, uh, you know, if we want this game to be something that is accessible to everybody, accessible to all ages, all groups, all platforms, um, I think that making something that kind of fit in a genre that gave it something unique, but also still made it accessible without, you know, closing out younger age groups was really important to us. Love it. Take us home, Christopher Turner. Well, <clears throat> like I said before, I'm, I'm on an HBCU campus, and so um, I can't go wrong with Madden 2K, and we have the leads that support that, our conferences uh, that we're a part of, SWAC, they support it. It's real heavy. Um, I know Nate supports it. A few other leads that, that support it, high school and collegiate. Um, you know, I did a I did a – a good job at taking surveys before starting all, all the programs. Um, and I continue to survey. Uh, we're going to have a survey that goes out uh, probably in the next two weeks uh, to each program. And so getting getting the students to kind of weigh in and see where they are, to see where they have accessibility to really helps. Um, and then, you know, being a part of a culture that really is getting to know what esports is, it's great to have a sports title in there and also Rocket League. Um, Rocket League, you can be anywhere at any time and look at that screen and understand what's going on with Rocket League. Uh, once again, I like I like Knockout City because of the, the mechanics. Uh, you have maps, you know, you have all those hard skills and that matter that can cross over to a Fortnite or a Call of Duty or or what have you for, for high school. I didn't have too many problems with the mature titles, uh, especially on a college level. Uh, we're kind of good to go there. High school level, we, we had to get parent permission forms, which is okay. It's better than just getting that hard no and not having to sell what esports is and why we should be playing those titles. Uh, we'd like to get into the mobile titles, but culturally, it's, it's just not you know played in our culture. We have more council-based uh, players than anything. <clears throat> and then I guess with Southern University Law Center building out the esports arena on the undergraduate campus and we're, we're representing underrepresented communities, we have to put everything on the, those PCs that we can. And so we have uh, some software that we've invested in uh, that we can upload many titles. So. I'm looking to see, you know, as the year progresses, you know, what games we're going to need to add or take away or anything of that sort, because, you know, I, I have to think about servicing everybody uh, just like Chris does. Yeah, absolutely. Love all the different perspectives on here too, right? Because we've got some folks from, from K-12, from higher ed. Um, and if you've seen some of the comments coming up on the screen so far, we have also got some all-stars that are tuning in and throwing comments in here um, from all levels. Really, really amazing. So this next one, I'm going to start with Josh um, because you had to actually make this decision um, at one point. Um, let's talk about free-to-play versus a paid title. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it completely changes the dynamic of how you are positioning different elements of the game. Um, I think in in a lot of free to play titles um, that are that are esports, uh, it's it's not quite as dicey an area, but there are a lot of places that have pay to win mechanics where the person who pays the most money has the most advantage. Um, doesn't always mean they win, um, but uh, it does give them an advantage. And that's something that is not great when you're supposed to have competition. You want everybody to be on a fully level playing field or you want it to be based on, uh, you know, just um, uh, your skill at an individual type of character um, for games that have different character classes and such. Um, in our specific scenario, uh, we always wanted right from the start when we were a pay to play game at, um, you know, 20 bucks last May um, and then in June of this year, money has always ever been for cosmetic only. And I think that that's really important for a few reasons. Cause it, I mean, one, you, you avoid any kind of um, unfairness in the competition. Um, 
but again, like, I know this has been said like nine times so far in the last 30 minutes, but it's accessibility. You want to make sure that, you know, obviously as developers, we have to make money. We want to be able to keep making this game for years into the future. So we have to make money somehow, but I think going cosmetic only is one of the least predatory ways that you can do that. There are a lot of business models out there that, that don't feel great and free to play is kind of this slippery slope where there are ways that you can do it that feel good and ways that you can do it that, that don't feel good. And I think we, we're really happy with how we design Knockout City to, you know, it's a game about style. It's a game about how you're showing up to these brawls. Um, and so looking, looking cool while you do it is important, but you know, it's, it's not going to help you play any better if, um, if you're not spending the time. I think that's super important to point out. And, and I think that, coming from a role where where I was the one who had to like make the decision about what we buy and don't buy as a school district as well. I think having like really simple uh, purchasing options is also important because, you know, I, I, I forget what game it was recently. Um, it might've been iRacing, right? But I just looking into how are we going to help support schools that are like implementing that and seeing that it's a subscription model, right? So you're paying each month or each year uh, every year, I think to your point, that limits the accessibility for a lot of students. So um, does anybody else want to hop in on um, free to play or uh, paid? I, I see a comment from Mike uh, about Fall Guys. It's actually uh, uploaded on my computer. I have not yet uh, been able to play it due to my schedule, but I plan on playing it. But I don't know how we're going to be able to implement that in middle school and high school. Maybe Chris, you can answer that. Uh, but I, you know, uh, I plan on doing some game nights with it. Uh, I know you have, you know, the, the private uh, game rooms now that you can implement on fall guys. And I plan on having it a part of my program programming on um, the Baton Rouge landmass this year for sure. Yeah. I mean, so um, there's three games, I guess, specifically, uh, that I really like to use to build out a community. And I call them party games, even though I'm not, they're not true party games, but um, Fall Guys, uh, Fortnite, and Apex, right? And what's great about those games is I, as one person, can host a lobby for hundreds of people. And when you think about, again, you know, accessibility uh, and inclusivity, looking at my league, I know that, you know, the heart of our competitions, right, the varsity scheduled stuff like that runs Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Nobody really kind of does too much on Fridays. Um, and so Mondays, what we wanted to do as a league was we wanted to have this community kind of gaming where, number one, coaches can choose to have an esports practice or not have practice at all, but those kids still have something to do. And number two, we have 196 school districts, in, uh, you know, playing with us in New Jersey, but that's not everybody. And we get a lot of emails from kids saying like, you know, uh, we, I want to play, you know, but my school won't start one. And so a way for to get them involved is through that community kind of gaming. So what we do is we run Fortnite, uh, Apex, and we'll now run Fall Guys um, basically on Mondays. And after school, the kids can, whether, wherever they are, as a team at their school, at home, whatever device they have, anything can all play with us on Monday because it really just takes one person, me, to run an entire game for a community. Um, and so what I really love about that is it's a way for, you know, besides giving coaches a day to practice or a day off to breathe, because one of the biggest things, especially in K-12, but I'm sure, you know, Caitlin experiences it and, and Chris at the collegiate level is burnout. Um, our coaches, you know, are coaching esports all year. They're getting paid barely anything. And esports is becoming so popular, and these teachers are, you know, usually the favorite teacher of these kids that they're running multiple games even in a season. It's not uncommon for a team to play Rocket League with us on Tuesdays and to play League of Legends with us on Thursdays. So these coaches are getting stretched thin. So we baked into, you know, that league on Mondays is kind of like a day off or a practice day. GSE, right? We'll run things for a state level competition. Um, but basically, we use scoring. Um, you know, uh, on a weekly basis, if you think first place gets 40 points and second place gets 35 and you go all the way down, you do, you know, uh, we have found the attention span tends to run four to six weeks, right? So we'll run four to six weeks, little mini seasons. Then we rotate the game 
But basically, you know, after the end of that little mini season, you have a season champ. And so whether it's Fall Guys or it's uh, Fortnite or there, or it's Apex, um, it's a really cool way to run uh, something for a lot of kids that doesn't take a lot of manpower. So it really fits in for uh, a vision for us where what we're trying to do, you know, to give back some time to uh, our club advisors. Caitlin, any thoughts from, from your role on um, free to play and paid titles? Um, yeah. Um, so I think it's kind of unavoidable paid titles. Um, and I think the, the example that comes to mind more often than not is call of duty and the college call of duty season follows the professional call of duty season. And so we're looking at a new game almost every single year. Um, what we started talking about was, you know, that's, that can, that's 60 bucks every single year, year to year that we're asking our students to, um, essentially pay if they want to continue to play. Um, and we decided, you know, that's, that's not the greatest way to run things. So since we live in um, the athletics department here at St. Mary's University, we just decided we're going to call these games equipment and we're going to pay for it going forward. That if you're on the Call of Duty team, purchasing the digital version of that Call of Duty game is part of your yearly equipment. We will take care of it as we do your practice gear and your jerseys and your mouse pads and anything else you might need to compete. Uh, so yeah, that's how, kind of how we approached that, um, that situation. And personally, I love the free to play games where the only thing you're paying for is cosmetics. Um, <laughs> I think it's very, um, ah, it's like that flair almost of, this is this really cool thing that I am going to show up to whichever game, you know, wearing. Uh, so I, I really like those kinds of things. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed, um, and not just in esports titles, but all kinds of video games is these collaborations and partnerships that they do with designers and artists and things like that. So that is very cool. And also is a wonderful um, topic to talk about in terms of like what else exists in video game and esports marketing and creative um, roles and world building, but topic for another day. Um, so when it comes to the, to the paid games, we try to cover as much of that as um, equipment. Love that. Love that model. Love the idea. Um, so, so important for the space, right? That we, that we do have options and we do meet people where they are. So I think, you know, you were talking about, um, college call of duty and i saw that sergio um, has been following along and commenting here and there so i'm sure he's excited for call of duty to get a little shine here today um over at uh, umd super exciting for them and building out the program there um so the next big i think categorical conversation that we tend to have around games is console and pc um so why is it maybe important to focus on both? What are some common titles? Um, and uh, Chris Turner, let's kick this one off with you. Uh, sure. You know, you have a lot of games that are trying to get into the cross-platform uh, world. And so, you know, council, uh, you know, to the point that Chris made earlier, you know, when you think about Switch, you think about Mario Go Karts. Uh, a few other titles like uh, Smash Bros. Uh, that are that are big games, right? And so you you need those consoles in your space and on your campus to make it happen. I was I was one of the guys a few years back that just had my PlayStation and my Switch on my campus. Uh, now we have labs, but <clears throat> you know going going to like the whole pipeline. If you're looking at you know. Ugh, the pro atmosphere and the collegiate atmosphere, you have to have PCs. Um, and I think some of those hard skills that you get from those PC games, the earlier, the better. Um, but, you know, we, like we talked about earlier, you know, you have a lot of K through 12 schools that can't afford those those PCs. And so we, we're going to have to make just, just do, you know, you have some consoles that you can hook up an old keyboard and, and mouse to. Uh, so it's, it's those type of options uh, that are available. 
But for me, and, and just looking at the ecosystem that we're a part of, uh, knowing that we have accessibility problems and knowing that, you know, the price points are not where, where they should be, um, you know, in order for our, our children to stay productive and stay, you know, at an industry standard, PC is definitely the way that we should be pushing, um, you know, and, and knowing knowledge of, you know, what's the difference between, you know, some of these processors and some of these graphic cards, because a lot of games now, you know, you don't need a real big graphic card to play, a uh, real big processor to play. So it's just doing your research on what particular game you need for what particular machine you have and, and trying to make something happen uh, on, on, on the PC side of things as much as you can, knowing that councils are always going to be there. It's always going to be a part of the thread. But, you know, we need to arm our kids and, and make them feel comfortable with the technology as soon as possible. Yeah, I think um, what's funny on, on our side is is every time we have like a uh, an administrator who comes to us and says, like, here's what we need for our program. We can always tell if a student is the one that told them what they needed because they'll come in the bag. Um, you know, we're going to be playing Rocket League. So we need an I-9, 3090s. And, you know, they have those conversations when in reality, there is almost no game out there that requires access to that, that kind of firepower. Um, but let's, let's keep the conversation going here. Consoles and PC. Um, Aviles, what does this look like for you guys at Garden State Esports? Yeah. Uh, the reality is that most schools don't have the PCs. So we have to offer just as many ways to get involved as possible. But I think Chris is right when he says that PCs are the direction that we should be moving kids. Uh, you know, throw the the playing experience, I guess, kind of out the window because nobody's joining Garden State Esports for competitive gaming, right? They're joining for the social emotional learning aspect and they're joining for the career and technical education aspect. And the reason why uh, we do our best to, you know, try to help them identify PCs they may already have or upgrades to existing PCs that they can make on the cheaper, you know, if we could get them to really invest in STEM uh, by getting some PCs, the real selling point is that they can have a team behind the team. And that means that these schools can have broadcasting. Um, they can have a website developer, they can have kids doing IT, they can have a statistician. Um, you know, one of the big things that we do through Garden State Esports is we empower these programs to experience, I think is really important. Um, but the other side of things is we have to make sure that we're meeting these kids where they are. And, you know, we always look for something like a knockout city that's cross play, can play over as many different, you know, devices as possible. Um, and then we're really starting to look hard into do we want to offer uh, even something that's mobile specific, like a clash of clans, you know, so it's, it's a balancing act. we got to make sure that we offer as much as we can. So as many kids can play and have those opportunities and experiences with us. But ultimately I would love to see every, you know, school in New Jersey, if not nationwide invest in STEM and, you know, get these computers. And after school, they magically can become the esports computers, but during school, you know, they're, they're doing all that stuff. Um, you know, that we want to see our kids do, developing those skills uh, so they can go and, you know, fill these STEM jobs out there. So it's, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a preference, even as somebody I've never owned a console in my life. I've been on a PC since I was, you know, like four. Um, but I have to make sure that we're able, number one, the most important thing is just getting kids involved. So whatever we have to play to get kids involved is going to be what we do. Um, but number two, you know, if we can get schools to see esports as a uh, investment in STEM and get these computers to make sure then that they're doing the computer programming, the website design, the graphic editing, the, you know, uh, virtual reality stuff. Um, you know, I know that we tie a lot of like uh, the Unreal stuff, you know, the Epic Accelerator type of stuff into our programs, you know. So after school, they're maybe playing the games, but during the school day, they're building the games. So I, I think that's why I would like to slowly push and, and promote people moving towards PCs. Um, you know, it has nothing necessarily to do with the gaming experience, but it's the opportunity for kids to get hands-on skills with these very lucrative STEM jobs. Because you can't be serious about STEM and not be serious about esports. 
Love it. That's a good sound bite. We're going to have that one, you know, looping later. Um, Caitlin, you're in your space right now, um, which is awesome. So maybe just tell us a little bit about what's the balance like for you at St. Mary's when we talk about console and PC. Um, truth be told, there is a, um, we lean more towards PC. Um, the majority of our students who are on our teams are playing either PC only games or that version of the game on PC like Call of Duty. They may be using console controllers, um, but the game itself is, itself is still being played on PC. Um, what I have found though is that consoles are a great way to bridge the gap sometimes. Um, in San Antonio local area, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of, uh, of students at the college level and the high school level that play um, FPS games on console which is great when we want to recruit, um, but not so great when we actually get to practice and we get to the league play. Um, currently, the College Rainbow Six Siege leagues require that you are, that the game is played on PC. So we find ourselves sometimes in the situation where we're asking this console player who's played Rainbow Six Siege forever, forever, forever on a console to make the switch to PC. Um, granted, <laughs> we do have the equipment to support them and the time to help support them and the, the extra hours that they can put in, you know, after class and on the weekends to make that switch. Um, but it can be a challenge for that reason alone. Um, but on the flip side, we have these wonderful games like Rocket League, where you can play on pretty much anything. Um, most people will play with a controller, but every now and again i'll see someone playing keyboard and mouse um but i think it is important to have a balance and to just have the opportunity or not even the opportunity but to have both both console and pc accessible um for any number of reasons whether it is to help bridge a gap or because a student really prefers to play rocket league on an xbox uh, versus a play uh, versus a playstation or a pc um and even taking it further than that, we have a very large student staff. We have about 25 students on our staff. Um, 20 of them are paid. And a lot of them are on our broadcasting team. And we broadcast exclusively from PCs using vMix. Um, and they are trained on all of these PCs to use this software um, for all of our broadcasts. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think we do lean pc heavy because of what we're trying to achieve both competitively and with our student staff you know we want to prepare them for real life um working in a team setting and learning new software learning new ways of doing things there's a hundred different ways to accomplish a successful broadcast and um, exposing them to these kinds of softwares that are pretty robust <laughs> it's the same thing we use um to, to broadcast our softball team or our men's basketball team so to us there is a a pretty big leaning on um pc however i do disagree with the stem focus um because i am someone who believes yes you absolutely need stem in your program but p uh but within the world of esports, I think a lot of esports is marketing. How you tell the, your story, how you make it easily digestible to a large audience that includes parents, admins, students, their peers. Um, and so we have a very big number of students that come from our, our business school who are studying business management and marketing. We have students from our arts and humanities school that are communications major and digital visual arts majors that help tell that story of our players and what we're trying to achieve. So yes, we also have a, a very, very large amount of students that come from our science, engineering, and technology school. It's about an even 30-30-30 split or 33-33-33. Um, but you need a little bit of everything. And the tool that gets us to where we want to be is the PC. So we're going to continue down that path. But that is what we do. And we're not a one size fits all. Well, and I think that the also it's different from level to level, 
right? So collegiate is also a lot different than than K-12, right? When we're talking about working with K-12, we are also trying to make sure that our students are coming to school and participating in school on a regular basis. Not that you're not trying to do that at high ed. Obviously, we all want that across education, but they have to be in school, right, for K-12. And so, you know, that it is nice to be able to use it to help get them involved in some of those STEM careers as well. Whereas for sure, especially at the um, collegiate level, we see a huge um, focus on the broadcasting side. Um, I do want to throw a little twist on this question before I hand it to Josh. And I did not say this ahead of time to him. So we're just going to put him on the spot. Um, Josh, when we're talking about cross-platform play, um, you know, from the developer side, like technically, what does that look like when you make the decision to say we're going to be cross cross platform instead of just um, one one specific? I think it. The answer to that varies based on what your game is. I think. I think if you're if you're a game that has a large advantage for being. Uh, for having keyboard mouse versus having a controller. That's a different story than if you are not, uh, you know, something like a, like a Hearthstone that's been mentioned a couple of times. You can play that on mobile the same as you can on PC and there's no advantage on one or the other. Um, whereas most first person shooters, having a mouse and keyboard is a really big advantage because it's about that precision aiming. But Knockout City, despite having that uh, kind of zoomed out view that makes it look a little bit like a, like a third person shooter, um, because everything has this auto lock on mechanic, uh, it plays more like a fighter in some ways. And it's more about that precision timing than the precision aiming. So with that being the case, there's, there's very, very little uh, difference in um, skill level and capabilities. I mean, we have the data on our backend. We know the win rates on uh, Nintendo Switch versus uh, PlayStation 5, which, you know, can do the higher frame rates uh, versus a PC where you can use a controller or um, keyboard mouse. And the, the win rates are really, really close uh, to the point that it was just a no-brainer for us to go cross-play. Um, again, that accessibility you know, I, I play on PS5. Uh, the person that I play Knockout City with the most plays on PC. Uh, we, the fact that we just don't even need to think about it. It's just, okay, can you play Knockout City? Then we can play together. And that's really kind of at the core of what we wanted this game to be. Excellent. Thank you so much. So um, I wanted, there's a few good questions that came through um, <clears throat> in the comments here. So I'd love to talk through a couple of those. Um, a few were questions, a few were comments. So um, first one, LaQuinn Thompson, um, any thoughts about racing games uh, with the new Disney Speedstorm coming out soon? Would that be an option? Mario Kart also. And Chris, um, I know you answered this a little bit on LinkedIn um, as we were going, but maybe you can hop in here. So it's interesting is we'll play whatever the kids want. You know, if there's interest um, in a game, we will find a way to offer it. You know, we have our varsity seasons, which are typically eight weeks in a playoff, but then we also have what we call Contenders League, which is uh, your JV experience, a little bit more fun, shorter seasons, four weeks, no playoffs. And, you know, we can experiment with game modes and different games and stuff like that. So we're looking at like uh, Guilty Gear Strive, I think, because we're trying to bring a fighting game in. Um, but one of the games we did play around with was Mario Kart. Um, and Mario Kart competition in the school versus school form uh, was kind of a flop, but Mario Kart time trials where you basically just, you know, worked all week and submitted a screenshot of your best time worked out really well. Um, but I think there's, uh, you know, in, in the racing world, it's, we don't have a ton of popular titles. Um, and again, thinking about things at scale, running things from a state level, there are certain games which, um, you know, just don't lend themselves to esports and playing virtually school versus school while everybody's at their home site. Uh, but also just the amount of people we have on a team, right? The average team size for Garden State Esports is 23 kids. And if you're playing a Madden, you're playing a FIFA, you're playing, you know, some of these racing games, it's basically one person versus one person. And then the other 22 kids are kind of just sitting there watching and the games tend to take a long time. Um, so I think some of that stuff makes it difficult. But I would love for a racing game uh, to come around. And like I said, is it's surprising 
some of these communities that pop up and all of a sudden reach out to us. And they're like, Hey, you know, we would love to play this. And Splatoon three, all of a sudden is getting a lot of traction, you know, in our discord, all these kids and schools want to play Splatoon three. So now we're offering that. And, um, you know, that's kind of where Mario Kart came from. And, uh, you know, a few other games we're messing around with, but, um, you know, I, I think there's room for all these titles, but it's almost like at what point do you have too many games to play and you water down what you offer? And then part of it too is whether or not it cracks our varsity season, we have to look at what the colleges are doing. And as far as I'm aware, there's no racing at the collegiate level. Um, so unfortunately, it's probably never going to make a varsity season uh, just because we want to reserve those opportunities for you know, college scholarships. All right, we're going to hop to the next question here because it feeds off of you almost said this question word for word as you were as you were talking. Um, so and I know because this is a collegiate one, I'm going to throw this to Caitlin first. How do you decide whether to drop support or add support for a new title? Um, yeah, I love this question. Um, we get this a lot. Uh, we publish this on our website, the actual criteria that we look at. Um, it's the rating of the game the minimum number of students required to field a team if we cannot meet that minimum we're not going to field that team um, um that's not at the top of our list but it is something we like to guys pull our students keep 100 percent of what they earn um but again always always nice to know what the um, prize pool if any is we look at um the leagues or the competition offering if there is membership involved is there a tournament fee involved um and if so you know what is it we do like to go with competitions that have um some kind of fee usually ensures that our opponent will show up for game time since they put a little put a little money up to do so um but those are the things we look at whenever we're um adding or dropping a title we call it sunsetting um, but one of the things that's kind of a 50-50, a we look at it, but it's not always the deciding factor, is developer support. Um, some games have phenomenal developer support, um, and some games the developer is very hands-off, or perhaps the developer is not very um, supportive of community or scholastic competition. Um, Again, this isn't the, the make or break for the decision, but it does weigh heavy into the choices that we make. Um, I think a great example of all of these things is Psyonix and Rocket League. Um, lots of developer support, uh, pretty small minimum team size required, just three people at the college level. And there is an, amp, uh, an abundance of competitions for us to choose from. So I think at St. Mary's, Rocket League isn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, and, I, and with the announcement of um, Riot supporting um, their own um, college Valorant season, that goes to the top of my list for next year. That will definitely influence some of my recruiting decisions. And if we're going to bring a Valorant team next year, undecided yet, but great question. I love this question because there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, Excellent. Thank you so much. And I feel like we could talk to this panel all day. Um, this could be the longest panel discussion webinar ever. We could have gone eight hours today. We won't do that to you. Um, we are at the hour mark here. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists so much. Um, I learned just an incredible amount, um, like I do every time that we get to have um, experts like this, folks who are in the field who are who are charged with making like these decisions literally right caitlin's talking about not only does she have an opinion on this but she has to do this every year when she's evaluating titles so so important thank you to um the the educators the industry folks that tuned in thank you josh for bringing um that developer perspective to us here today um and for creating an amazing game we also appreciate that very much um I am currently playing it on keyboard and mouse, but now that I know that you're playing it on console, I may have to switch things up. So thank you so much, um, everybody, and have a great, great day.